So one of the things that I'm trying to do is to look at the ways that race is narratively constructed. How does race exist as a phenomenon? Part of the way that it goes on is through the ways that we write out historical reality or how we construct it using narrative. And so the master narrative is that sort of unspoken, taken for granted knowledge that is passed on to us as what it means to just understand life in general that is constructed by hegemony. The hegemony is the group, not an official group, but that body that dictates what things are and what they mean. In most cases in America, we're talking about white Anglo-Saxon Protestant land-owning males. If you don't fit in all those territories, you're probably not hegemonic. But there are a lot of hegemonic wannabes. Okay, but the master narrative is the thing that you understand of what it means to be American and most of what it means to be alive. Now, there are competing narratives. So African-American cultural narratives are, are, are sort of intrinsically in conflict with mainstream notions of reality. If, I, I don't, that's a whole nother lecture series, I'm going to give it to you in a, in a little bite-sized piece. For example, mainstream notions of reality are about competitivism and individualism, materialism, right? So the one person who has the most money wins. He who dominates and controls is in charge. That's the winner. African-American cultural reality says that it's communal, it's commensal. We are one with the universe, one with nature, or used to be. Let's not go by now. Okay. And that we are spirit-driven versus material. These are warring sensibilities. And so the people who are in charge dictate what is real, and then other people try to sort of live around it. The one thing that I'm trying to get us to see is that lynching becomes a sort of script that people use to write out this alternative reality. So I'm looking at lynching narratives in particular, which, is, which are specific kinds of narratives that you won't get to until the third lecture when you get your $20 at Gallery 1. And those are first per person eyewitness accounts, most many of which were written by actual lynchers themselves. So they went to the lynching, they lynched somebody, they came home, wrote a book about it, published it, that's a lynching narrative. Sometimes they were eyewitnesses, sometimes they were uh, lynching apologists, sometimes they were pro-lynching advocates, runs the whole spectrum, right? So I'm suggesting that this reality that dictates how we know what race means, how we know who has privilege, how we know who does not, who are the women, what does it mean to be a woman, who are the men? All of this gets written out in discourse, which is what English people look at, and I'm suggesting that lynching is one of the means by which these identities are facilitated. Are you with me so far? That's what you missed the first time. Okay, now, the second thing I wanna, okay, that was two things. The third thing I wanna say, I'm gonna use the word colored and Negro a lot, and that's because I am quoting newspaper accounts. And it's really cumbersome and funky when people say, end quote, and then they say something, and then they say, end quote, it's distracting. I don't want to do this. If you hear me use the word Negro and color, I'm quoting somebody else, okay? So let me begin, and I'm hoping that we have some rigorous discussion afterwards. Right, this is the <coughs> Victoria Theater. Which of these many? Okay. Oh, the other thing is, you heard I was the founder of the Tony Morrison Society, so as far as I'm concerned, all things begin and end with Tony Morrison, and so shall this talk. The opening lines of Tony Morrison's seventh novel, Paradise, pro provocatively claims, they shoot the white girl first, but the rest, they can take their time. The narrative's action begins with a black lynch mob sinking its quarry a clutch of runaway women whose conduct has insulted the adjacent town's cultural sensibilities. The nine members of the all-black mob that attacked the so-called convent outside of Ruby, Oklahoma, are protecting the interests of the town's three congregations. Being 90 miles from the nearest badge, there is no formal criminal justice system in Ruby. So the founding families and the members of the three Christian churches collectively perform this civic role. In this way, they are metonymic of real-world lynch mobs, 
that were populated by, or the very least authorized by, the town's best men. Among them, professionals, businessmen, elected officials, <coughs> clergy, and law enforcement, who's led, who legislated ad hoc justice and defined <coughs> social propriety on behalf of the community's institutions. We are told that the men feel obliged to stampede or kill the troublesome interlopers who they believe are corrupting Ruby's social order. Later, they will claim they went to the convent simply to run off the women, but the pre-dawn raid finds them outfitted for lynchcraft with rope, handcuffs, mace, and guns. In many ways, this attack replicates authentic mob culture. The gravity of their purpose unifies what otherwise would be simply a motley crew of assassins. The irreconcilable differences that have splintered Ruby's generations and congregations take a back seat to the one point upon which they are all said to agree. They must protect Ruby's racial homogeneity and civic character from the offenses of outsiders. The raid on the convent seems especially ironic and untoward, not only because they attack hapless women, but also because the men are so-called eight rocks, the blackest of black people, who are themselves the victims of racist rejection, censure, and purging by everyone from Yazoo to Fort Smith. On their veritable trail of tears from Mississippi to Louisiana, from Mississippi and Louisiana to Indian Territory, where they build the first all-black town, Haven, they were refused shelter and succor by other blacks, who, like whites, rebuked them for their skin color, ruthlessness, and poverty. Given their history, one would expect them to be more compassionate toward the itinerant women who had found shelter at a mostly abandoned way station 19 miles from Ruby. But community defense trumps cultural empathy when it comes to protecting civic interests. During the Jim Crow era, isolated community, communities like Ruby often relied upon lynch law to protect the dignity and purity of its women and children. However, they were sometimes its victims as well. Generally, lynching was used to establish or correct social behavior by enforcing racial and gender protocols. Thus, as the women at the convent discover, white women who are unchaste and or cross the color line in their dalliances could expect their lovers to meet the business end of a rope or revolver. Black women who stepped outside of their place at the bottom of the social paradigm and those who were simply at the wrong place at the wrong time, or who allied themselves with the wrong man, could expect to pay for those transgressions with their lives. At first, Morrison's depiction of black-on-black -black vigilantism seems expressly fictional, since Jim Crow racial politics normalized the practice of whites lynching black men as a social control. But upon close interrogation, it becomes clear that she is not that she is simply uncovering or recovering authenticating African American realities that have been obscured by racialized discourse. In Paradise, the lesser known ventures of black cultural construction and civil defense form the foundation of the narrative's action. Communal rounding of undesirable was a common method of policing one-horse towns like Ruby in the Jim Crow era. But lynching did more than maintain the status quo. It also worked to authenticate mainstream configurations of social identity and power. That is, lynch law defined racial and gender politics by establishing who had power, who did not, and on whose behalf power might be wielded. White men who relied on carnage to protect their women in communities stipulated by doing so that American social identity was white, that American social culture was male-dominated and anti-black, and that lethal violence was the preferred means by which the disenfranchised might be controlled and dominated. 
Notwithstanding this, historical records indicate that African Americans also took the law into their own hands to protect their communities from those who breached cultural mores or committed crimes, like allegedly the convent women. Why then is this sort of black social control virtually unknown? The answer is simple. Black agency cannot logically exist within the context of white supremacy and Jim Crow repression. Thus, those discourses of race with which we are most familiar might lead us to assume that pre-integration whites would have considered the very idea of a black lynch mob preposterous, since master narratives suggest that African Americans were denied sufficient social and political power to determine for themselves who should live, who should die, why, how, or when. And yet, 19th and early 20th century newspapers, black and white, offer ample evidence that phalanxes of militant, armed, lynch-minded blacks were determined to define and defend the parameters of acceptable civil behavior for blacks and whites within their communities. This fact might help to explain why racial reprisals targeted at blacks were so harsh and seemingly so unrelenting. There were angry men with guns on both sides of the color line who were not afraid to use it. My analysis of this phenomenon employs cultural critique to situate the occurrence of black lynch mobs within a dynamic network of mainstream racial practices public discourses, and evolving cultural values. This form of analysis examines the cultural limit, the point where warring sensibilities clash, to better understand how competing discourses and power vie for dominance. My aim is to show the fluidity of power that uses vigilantism and lynching as its marker. Black vigilantes, especially those who exacted retribution from white criminals for crimes against their communities, proved that the boundaries of civil power were hotly contested among and between the races, and that taken for granted diet of white power, black powerlessness under white supremacy was anything but static or certain. The existence of black vigilantes indicate, in fact, that assertions of white supremacy required constant maintenance and reiteration for self-authorized blacks, especially those who sought to preserve African-centered cultural values and black civic authority within their segregated, or not, environments. It was the inequities of Jim Crow culture that perpetuated a civil dynamic that gave rise to black lynch mobs in the first place. Since whites had little regard for the legal rights and protections of blacks, and considered violent crime part of the African American's character, they usually failed to maintain law and order in black communities. Thus, African American leadership was often compelled to impose their own justice for crimes that were committed against them by other blacks especially in racially marginalized or remote communities like Ruby. Evidence of their determination to define an acceptable civic status quo is typified in an Atlanta Constitution story about a crowd of 40 Negroes that attempted to lynch a Negro foreman. Owing to the isolation of the locality where the riot occurred, the newspaper justifies there were no white officers to be had. The Constitution may have minced words by refusing to call the crowd of Negroes a mob, but they were not confused about the power implications of the cabal that made it news. Journalistic evidence accounts for most of what we know about black lynch mobs. That is, the activities of black mobs were well known contemporarily as were those of white mobs though their occurrence was less frequent. The usually front page, often headline accounts reveal an alternative cultural logic to the practice of lynching among blacks. 
that is, mobs of African Americans formed locally, and only when cultural mores were unequivocally breached, especially those concerning sexual assault or the malicious murder of mothers, children, or the elderly. In other words, black mamas did not cross county and state lines to participate in or witness gang murder for the fun of it, as did whites. While blacks may have agreed with whites that some crimes warranted lynch law as a response, they usually differed with regard to the means by which rough justice should be carried out. In most cases, black mobs simply executed perceived outlaws, usually shooting or hanging them, or sometimes both. However, displays of torture, overkill, pageantry, or carnival in their judicial enactments were exceedingly rare, even for criminals accused of the most abominable crimes. Of course, as one might expect, there are exceptions to this rule. For example, the colored men of Bradford County, Florida, gathered into an orderly mob and hunted down a Negro tramp in a Santa Fe swamp after he assaulted a colored woman who was expected to die from his brutal treatment of her. Brutal treatment is journalistic code speak for rape. The Atlanta Constitution offered kudos, if in a deprecating manner, for the mob's expeditious execution of lynch law, claiming not a white man was present and the lynching was systematically conducted. There was no disorder whatsoever. While the body was swinging from a limb, many Negroes pulled out their pocket knives and literally slashed the body to pieces. Over 100 cuts were shown on the body of the dead Negro, which presented a horrible sight. Tellingly, though perhaps predictably, since the victim of lynch law was African American, no arrests were made for the killing. The coroner's inquest returned the customary verdict for lynching, came to the death from hands of parties unknown. Since Jim Crow culture rendered black men susceptible to every sort of racist attack whites could conjure, black communities tacitly agreed that mothers, the young, and the old should be held inviolate from outrage or attacks, especially by black men. When six young Negroes engaged in a legal crime spree in Sunnyside, Texas, an infuriated mob did not wait for the Walker County courts to determine the criminal's guilt or to assign his punishment. Instead, they corralled the youths and hanged them for terrorizing local families. The fact that the mob did not resort to overkill, even though they had murdered an old man, a woman, a child, assaulted two girls, and burned their home, consuming their bodies in flames, suggests that the mob was more concerned with invoking punishment than vengeance. As with white mobs, black mobs sought to preserve the sanctity of the family, as the lynching of L. Thor Mosley, an African American, demonstrates. Most of his hung and his body riddled with bullets after a Frederick, Maryland County court acquitted him for the murder of a black man in front of his wife and child on a public road. A mob made up of the dead man's friends seized mostly from his home and exacted justice themselves for the crime he had committed. Lynch law was one of the means by which African Americans identified and enforced cultural values and ethics. Blacks who helped whites find and capture other blacks accused of crimes were often punished for traitorous behavior of being a white man's nigger. Such was the case in Leesburg, Georgia, when Al Thurman, a well-known and well-liked Negro, was fired upon by unknown parties and his body completely riddled with bullets. According to the Atlanta Constitution, it was through his efforts that Bivens, Holt, and Fort, three men accused of outraging a white woman in the presence of her husband, were brought to justice and later hanged. Thurman publicly announced his rebuke of the Negro's crime and openly stated that he would make every effort to secure their capture which he did. The article recounts his life was threatened by the friends of the three dead men who had arranged to kill three prominent white men 
who had organized the lynch mob. When Thurman heard about the plot, he took it upon himself to expose the scheme and to prevent their murders. He had almost succeeded in trapping the nine conspirators when they turned the tables and shot him to death in the road. Whether or not the three slain blacks were legitimate fodder for the lynching mill is less significant here than the obvious fact that this band of outlaw Negroes, as the article branded them, did not kowtow to local whites or fear retributions of racial violence and terror. More significantly, they offered an object lesson to other African Americans who would serve the white man's ends at the expense of black people. As was true for the outlaw Negroes, some African Americans defied Jim Crow justice, refusing to run, hide, or lay low from attacking whites. Negroes in Richardsonville, South Carolina, for example, were not alone in their determination to even the score with white lynchers and white cattles. They plotted to murder a white man or burn the home of a white man for every Negro that was lynched or whipped. This shows that certain African American communities disallowed lynching of fellow blacks by enraged whites on any account. So when whites in Key West, Florida attempted and failed to lynch Sylvania Johnson, a Negro, who was accused of assaulting Mrs. Maggie Atwell, they, they, infuriate, they infuriated local blacks who openly threatened to burn the city and kill all the white inhabitants. According to the Atlanta Constitution, the Negroes surrounded the county jail and the armory and began to discharge firearms in the ensuing fray, a white man was wounded by a stray bullet and another was beaten senseless. No retributive violence was recorded. This incident marks a black community's explicit refusal to accept fear, violence, and racial murder as their inevitable lot in one of the most lynching prone states in the Union, Florida. Vacation. Generally, however, African Americans did not endorse lynching's law lawlessness, murder, and mayhem. On the other hand, they were unwilling to allow criminals, black or white, to run amok. Blacks understood that the legal system was not, deserved to was not designed to serve their needs, and more often than not, would be used against them. As a result, they found themselves between a rock and a hard place when it came to protecting their families, homes, and communities. Notwithstanding this, most blacks still preferred to rely upon the bar of justice for civil and civilized punishment, rather than rely upon vengeful, murderous mobs for retribution. In certain quarters, especially in the Deep South, whites seemed to turn almost automatically to the rope and faggot whenever interracial crimes were alleged. Given these odds, the likelihood that an African American could stay out of harm's way depended more on luck than reasonable behavior, responsible behavior. Eventually, even African America's best men, wearied of the capricious assaults on the unprotected blacks and their communities, and turned away from racial accommodation in favor of the sword of retribution. As a result, black public discourses became increasingly militant over time regarding how best to deal with whites' lethal, lethal attacks. A nascent ideology of racial self-defense is typified in the following editorial from the Richmond Planet and African American Weekly. The writer rationalized black America's vulnerability to racial violence, contending the law fails to protect us, and in the face of murder, rapine, and arson as perpetrated against us, the offices of the law become as inanimate as though they had been turned to stone. There is but one way to remedy the evil. American citizens of African descent must make an individual defense. When lynchers come, the editorial invades, the shotgun, the rifle, the old saber, the sharpened axe, in fact, anything handy must be brought into play, and every man should consider it his duty to see <coughs> that 
at least one lyncher is left cold and stiff upon the ground before he yields up his life in accordance with the mob. <laughs> Published admonitions of this sort beg the question of African Americans' alleged sense of inferiority and helplessness under Jim Crow culture. And as a result, many legal assaults on black communities devolved into full scale riots, as in the case of Elaine, Arkansas, Rosewood, Florida, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Columbia, Tennessee, to name only a Mainstream papers record the fact that African Americans not only repulsed white mobs bent on imposing illegal brutal punishment, but also sought out and lynched criminal whites, often with impunity, but never without mainstream reaction. A Charleston News and Courier headline maintains, Lynch Law Reversed, when a white rapist was lynched by angry blacks in the heart of Dixie. While they predict that the hanging of a white man yesterday by Negroes in Pickens County, South Carolina, for the alleged commission of a crime for which Negroes are usually lynched, will doubtless be the subject of comment throughout the United States. They do not indicate their abhorrence for or censure of the deed itself. The article's tone borders on empathy, <coughs> allowing, albeit hegemonically, the Negroes seem to have acted very much as white men have done when the circumstances have been reversed, and from their point of view are doubtless justified by the examples set them. Yet the white newspaper's interpretation of events situates African American vigilantism, that is, proof of black civic power and subjectivity, within the distorting framework of white supremacy by suggesting that its social and historical meaning rests ultimately in the judgment of officious whites. The articles caveat that the conduct of white people who first dispersed the, the conduct of white people who first dispersed the Negroes and then allowed them to reassemble, here's that emphasis, and offered no resistance to the hanging is explicable in only two ways. Cowardice or approving of the lynching. The names given, including well-known citizens of Pickens, preclude the first alternative. Thus, we are forced to conclude that these men thought Waldrop ought to be hanged and were willing to have blacks adjudicate justice for themselves in this case. In the end, well, the philosophical question which lies behind this isolated instance of lynching reversed is whether the serious matter to which it relates, meaning rape, a good rule must necessarily work both ways. The articles claim that this problem has suggested itself to thinking men before, indicates that this is not the first or only interracial incident of African American mob action with which white Americans were forced to contend. Whatever they're thinking on this matter, the Charleston News and Courier offered no further journalistic reaction after the fact. African American newspapers frequently politicized the inequities of mainstream law that led to the lynching of blacks on both sides of the color line. Under the headline, four groups, three white men and one Negro perpetrate the nameless crime. The nameless crime is rape. The Atlanta Independent called for a just, even-handed legal system to punish whites who committed crimes against African Americans so a lynch mob would not have to intercede. The article discursively corrects traditional racist ideology which held that African Americans were inherently criminal, claiming a brute is a brute, whether white or black, and the color of skin cuts no figure. Upon chronicling the fact that a black rapist attacked a white woman, two white rapists assaulted two white women, and a white rapist outraged a Negro baby, all within a 10-day period, the feature calls for an, an equitable and effective criminal justice system that will protect the black
black community as well as the white. Not asking for special treatment, the independent advocates for racial impartiality in upholding the law. We have no sympathy for any class of criminals and have nothing but words of common commendation for the officers of the law who ran the Negro fiend to cover and convicted him upon his own voluntary confession. We only hope that the same authorities will be as diligent in bringing the white rapists to justice. The Negro brute and the white fiend deserve the same punishment and we have faith in the just administration of the law in Atlanta. The majesty of law must be maintained and the virtue of our women protected. If the whites shield the criminal element of their race from just punishment, they will suffer and the ratio of three to one will continue to be the record between the races in perpetuation of the nameless crime. The reference of ratio of three to one is the three white rapes to one black race. The Independent is clearly less militant than the Richmond Planet in making its point. It implies, rather than states its assumption, that Negro women deserve the same protections as white women and for the same reason. Notably, this article asserts that white men are guilty of sexual assault at a higher rate than black men and thus should be held accountable accordingly. Hence, it serves as a counter narrative to, to mainstream assertions that rape of white women was a black crime. More often than not, though, appeals for judicial equity or compassion for black communities fell on deaf ears, leaving them unprotected against criminalities of every sort. While there were exceptions, black retribution against whites was usually answered with lethal, even military force. Consequently, when blacks in Jacksonville, Florida, became determined to lynch a white prisoner who had killed a Negro the day before, the local military was called out to guard the jail. Undeterred by this show of force, local blacks organized, called for reinforcements, and met the militia head on. When whites attempted to disarm them, they were instantly fired upon from all directions by Negroes in concealment. Three of the posse refused slight flesh wounds and they were all obliged to leave. Whites feared a race war once, quote, large numbers of armed Negroes began arriving hourly from the surrounding country and from faraway points. So they fortified themselves with two 12-pound brass field pieces and one Gatling gun. These are automatic weapons that take out tanks. <clears throat> Predictable of lethal force, the weapons were said to be, quote, instrumental in quieting the Negro. Given what seemed to be the mainstream's unequivocal commitment to extirpate the Negro race, as in the aforementioned case, Many radical Negro newspaper editors use public discourse as a weapon of choice in the battle against Jim Crow violence. Outspoken and militant members of the press fill the pages of Negro weeklies with scathing diatribes against murderous white mobs, demanding an end to lynch law at whatever cost. Accordingly, when three black men and two black women were lynched near Greenville, Alabama for suspicion of murdering a white man, the Richmond, Virginia Planet decried a check must be placed upon the lawlessness of whites, admonishing, quote, every colored man to own a Winchester rifle and a revolver and know how to shoot it. The editorial averts lynching parties should be <clears throat> unceremoniously shot down. Their logic is simple. When lynching is followed by the funeral of one of the lynchers, the business will prove to be unprofitable and prejudiced, blood-stained white men will find some of the means for the employment of their idle time. <laughs> A month later, when no effort was made to punish the perpetrators of this heinous crime, their ire grew exponentially. A follow-up editorial entitled, No One Punished, called for American citizens of African descent to make an individual defense in protecting themselves and their homes. 
In no uncertain terms, the editorial calls for full-scale retaliation against lynchers, white and black, in the absence of protective laws. Their conclusion was fundamentally clear. Lynch law must go. So how is it that our knowledge of resistant, insurgent, and judicious civic protectors has disappeared from the historic and certainly oral memories of black and whites? There are all sorts of reasons why Americans succumb to a form of hysterical blindness or amnesia regarding this subject. White America's determination to define whiteness as God-given hegemony over rigorously repressed people of color is well documented. Thus, acknowledgement of black lynchers would have contradicted Anglo-American assertions of white supremacy and social dominion. It would also have contradicted the discursive assertions of black America's talented tenth, who argued assiduously that Jim Crow must go based on the African American's humanity, civility, and social compatibility with the cultural mainstream. Later, during the first half of the 20th century, power relations and cultural posturing would also have been compromised. The presence of self-authorized, gun-toting mobs of lynch-minded blacks stood to refute the mainstream socio-cultural control as well as African Americans' notions of moral superiority over their oppressors. And so the reality of black lynch mobs was quashed on both sides and faded from the historical landscape. Thus, with time, the angle of critique devolved. Accounts of murder, mayhem, and bloodshed among blacks in newspapers, white and black, focused primarily on the lowest classes who generally were the culprits of crime. Violent incidents concerning the upwardly mobile and elite classes of blacks went largely unremarked. In African American social, political, and historical narratives, unless they were the innocent victims of unluck or racist slight. Endeavors to uplift the race by means of self-conscious social critique were stifled by the tendency to skirt sensitive topics like, for example, evidence of African American criminality. Any meaningful engagement of this subject could have been misconstrued as affirming the commonly held belief that Negroes were inherently criminal and villainous. Since denial of these stereotypes required calling them to mind, most African Americans chose to gainsay the image through their right behavior. More specifically, if African Americans were reluctant to discuss the criminal behavior of their fellows publicly, it was because they understood that Jim Crow culture regarded all blacks alike. Thus, black people's conduct, especially with regard to interracial interactions, required continual vigilance for everyone's protection. Ultimately, Black lynching culture was primarily pragmatic. African Americans were compelled to police their own communities, not only for safety's sake, but also as a necessary function of cultural construction and management. White's inability to differentiate between acts of protective agency and criminal assault among blacks caused them to perceive all incidents of violence among blacks as if they were the same. The cultured African American <coughs> elite, of course, took umbrage at being conceptually lumped with the downtrodden black masses in the minds of whites. They also resented being subjected to the chaos, lawlessness, and violence that inevitably surfaced in communities left unprotected by mainstream law. Spatially connected to segregation, by segregation, to their poor, uneducated, and unachieving brethren, black elites then often set themselves apart ideologically and behaviorally from black peons who passively accepted the base lot of Jim Crow that Jim Crow allowed them. Better Negroes, 
like those in Ruby, endeavor to secure their relative safety and to exercise cultural autonomy and community control by insisting upon their right to define and control domestic and civil decorum on their own terms. Their cultural logic of lynching held that the sanctity of the black home was to be protected at all costs from all villains by guardians of the community. Violating this principle was sufficient impetus to set a black lynch mob on its corrective course. I thank you for your attention. Who doesn't need a dime, right? So people 
everywhere, all the time, follow the money. That's not to say people don't do research about things they care about. I'm talking about how things get to be books and articles, and then the people who are on the advisory boards for the journals have to decide they want to read your stuff. And if you aren't timely and you're not hot, you're not getting published, and there it goes. Of course, as is true with every rule, there's an except, there are exceptions. So don't take that as an across the board caveat. I'm talking about generally. And so the problem becomes, if information isn't presented in a particular way, in a scholarly journal or book that's, that's been published by a jury press, it's not real. So you get old Lady Mabel sitting around in her rocking chair in front of the fire after she's had a couple of Jack Daniels telling you about back in the day, that does not count. And she was there. You know, the Jack Daniels just disqualifies everything. <laughs> I suggest that we have it, you know, in here. This would have been a whole lot more better. But my point is that information gets politicized. And only certain kinds of bits of information then become acceptable and become sources of knowing. And when you put on top of that how people feel about things, lynching is, is some tough stuff. And so, you know, I don't know, one of the things that I wanted you to do, and then I forgot I wanted you to do it because I'm old, was I wanted you to think about what was the most provocative, you can still do this, we can still do this, it's not too late. What was the most life-altering racial incident that happened to you or that you witnessed that shaped how you think about things? Do you follow what I'm saying? When I was a little girl, just as an example, this is not my thing, but this is one thing. When I was a little girl, I, was, I lived in North Carolina and I was going what they call down east which meant there was no interstate yet. That's how old I am. There wasn't an interstate yet. And so we were going down east on the little two-lane highway, singing the songs in the car, because you know, that's what you did in those days. And we looked up. And you know, the road was like this. And as far as you could see in the rearview mirror and ahead of us were cars. And it sort of happened without us knowing it, because we were singing songs and being a family. And then I said to my family, it's probably me. I'm taking credit for this. Story. Now, oh look, what? what are all these cars? And we start looking at the cars, and the cars are full of Klansmen going to a Klan rally. And here are these three, as the newspapers would say, Negroes in this car, trying to go down east to the country, in the midst of a Klan rally caravan, as far as you can see. And so they see us just about the same time we see them. And they're giving us the finger and giving all kinds of symbols that they are, you know, that kind of stuff. So we had to spend the night where we were going because you couldn't come back down that road, right? I mean, not unless you wanted to be at the foot of one of those crosses. That, that was a life-altering thing for me. Then, when I was a grown rustic woman teaching at Gettysburg College, I used to have to cross the Mason-Dixon line every day from Pennsylvania to get back to Maryland. And I went past Emmitsburg, Maryland. And Emmitsburg is like the, the, the center of planned activity for the whole region. I mean, it was a huge planned activity place. Like all the plans used to go there to, to meet and do planned stuff. And I'm coming down the highway one day feeling really good about myself. I have a PhD, I have a new car, I'm getting tenure, riding along, feeling very good. And these three white guys ride up next to me and start calling me all kinds of niggers and stuff, and they roll me down the middle. And I am terrified. I don't usually do terror. <laughs> because I am thinking they don't know the rules. They're the most I am. And the bottom line is they don't, right? But my point was, from little girl to grown rustic woman, nothing had changed in terms of clans on the highway. Right. So I am cautious when I, this is life altering, right? My friend just sent me from North Carolina, we're talking about what I've seen in Mississippi, nothing. Because nobody would go with me. I'm not going out there by myself. Right. Some place I don't know. I read the book. I know what happened to Schroeder Goodman and Cheney. I'm not going. <laughs> right? These are things that shape who we are. I'm asking you, what has happened in your life that shapes who you are, that creates this narrative, because it's those scripts of race and identity
identity that give meaning to what it means to live not only in a civil society, but what it means for racial identity, right? In other words, you partially write the script. It's, it's part about how other people see you, and it's part about how you understand yourself within that context. So what I want to end with in my part before you start to speak about these black lynch mobs is we have been led to believe that black people in Jim Crow, in the Jim Crow era were powerless, that they were victims, just like we believe, I don't mean to start them in slavery, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the discussion last time about slavery. Okay, so, you know, we, all oh, those poor slaves, they handcuffed and bought the boat and they picking cotton and it's a damn shame. A whole lot of slaves just said, I'm not going to be your slave anymore. Right? right? You heard of maroons? You can't slave me to turn it into a verb. You can't do it. I'm going to stay here too. I'm not running. Because my people are over there on that plantation. I'm be right over there in those woods. I double dare you to come down there and mess with me. That was a reality. We don't know anything about that. Do you know why? Well, I don't even say we don't know anything about it because clearly I know it. Some of you know it. You know why we don't know that? Politics with this knowledge. It's a massive narrative. The massive narrative says black people are helpless, powerless, the victims of white tyranny. My paper says that based on newspaper articles, that is not only true. That's not the only truth. There were some. That there were plenty of people who said, I'm running this show in this neighborhood, in this community, and here's how we're going to do it. And you're going to die from something. I'm going to die from protecting my community. You see? These are the kinds of things that you want to begin to think about and find out for yourself so you can be free. You, by some standard, you are subjected to the master narrative because you, A, live in America, you're in an educational institution that, in part, understands that, asserts it while showing you how to resist it. But you don't resist it automatically. You have to work to resist it. You have to think about how to resist it. You with me? Amen. Questions? Comments? Arguments, fisticuffs. <laughs> no problems. Doctor Hill got Yeah, come on. I, I just want to go back to uh, to how the first the beginning of your discussing the you know, Islam. As someone who thinks about who thinks about black Islam, who thinks about all these questions <coughs> from a from a political theoretical point of view. What struck me right away um, was Franz Fanon's discussion of the Manichaean personality. What actually happens to the uh, to the uh, natives in the colonialized situation mm -hmm. where the violence becomes a cleansing that. Um, and as you as you talked about uh, Black Islam, the question that came to, to me is that that's something that we have to understand uh, about the psychology of that. Mm -hmm. And Which I want to, well, this is my question, but how, how do we understand that um, psychologically, that is for, for black people in, in, in this era, in this epoch, uh, that black people, this one, uh, uh, the that period of lynching, right, 1917, mm -hmm. where lynching Lynching, the lynching of black people, and you know that actually other non black groups was in that course. Mm -hmm. right? And here they have black lynching mm -hmm. How do we understand that? I, I, not that you had that answer to this, but I want to, want to understand that from a psychological standpoint. What is going on there psychologically? I can tell you what Francis Nolan says, mm -hmm. but um, what ought we apply to that kind of problem? Well, I, I, you're right, I don't have the whole answer to that, but I certainly have a partial response to that. And, and part of my response is that I would not want to categorize it as a problem, but as a situation. And here's why. Now, let me, let me say um, that what I read to you today is, is a small excerpt from a larger article. It was so hard to pull stuff out and make it have sense because the, there's lots more parts of it. 
But one of the things that got taken out of the uh, essence of time was that in this period, a couple of things are true. Life is what we would certainly think of now as violent in general. People have to catch their food. <laughs> okay? I mean, and so people hunt and they slaughter food. If you eat, you slaughter it. They don't have the uh, croak there, right? Uh, certainly not in the 19th century, uh, in, in, in these places where these things <coughs> happen. If you were in New York City, it was grocery store. I'm saying out in the, in the certainly in the deep south of these back waters. And so life is, life is, is violent in many respects. People use weapons and guns all the time. And, and people shoot out their differences. More importantly, almost everybody's drunk. Seriously, you know why? There isn't really potable water. You see, I've got three bottles of water up here. <laughs> Thank you. 
you know, they saw white people doing it. And, but, well, mm -hmm. can I interrupt you? Because I want to get the point I want to make. I mean, we got to make the distinction between sort of domestic protection and religion. And the thing, the difference between those two is whether your daddy goes and gets the gun and repulses the person who came into the house or who raped your mom in the road, or whether he goes and gets five or six people to help him do that. There's, that's the distinction. So lynching is three or more people who are acting to leverage a form of justice in place of the criminal justice system versus protection. You've got to make that distinction. And I would say for another day that one of a great discussion is that is the um, Emmett Till lynching, so-called lynching, which you know I, doesn't fit the, doesn't fit the paradigm of the lynching. It's a murder, right? But now, in the last couple of years, they have decided there were some other people in the car, which is four people, which makes it a lynching. But he wasn't acting in in service to justice. He was acting to protect or to to respond to him having you know, disrespected his wife. So, under the culture of that time, because women are property. Remember, we talked about this last time. This is how gender, this is how lynching affects gender. Women are property, and so if a man assault, insults you or assaults you, he is literally offending the man. So the man is responding less about you than about him, because remember, honor is the number one thing. Sorry, y'all missed that last week. Honor is the number one thing. And so, I mean, in the culture, I don't mean in lynching, and so, the, the core of a mainstream society is based on honor. If somebody comes along and does something to your property, i.e. your wife or your daughter, you are forced to respond in a particular way. And if it's heinous enough, the other people around you are forced to respond also because we can't have that kind of thing in this neighborhood. I don't want to take the heart of it out, but that's interesting in how society, we're a sociologist, how we construct these patterns, that's what a social order is. That a society decides what are the rules of living here with us. This is how we're going to work. Yes. Yes. Way right in the back. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that's the side of all we have. You talk, you talk, you do the things to me. Oh, no. I'm saying the social order is like with black, with black within the dominant society. But then it's in a territorial position where information hadn't got out to him because he gave an example of them bringing the military force in to, to like subdue the people who had gotten together with them. They had gotten information out, I guess. You know, it's like war. You know, so I'm saying, to me, it's like it's two different stories. We're telling our story, just like even with this, we're going all the way up to like the 60s. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about the 60s, you're talking about people who actually live now, mm -hmm. who have experienced the same things that you said you experienced growing up in the Eastern Coast. You know, we, we did live this time here. Mm -hmm. And so we still see examples up. But what I'm saying is, it's like two different stories. We get to tell our story, I think, by understanding your position. Started out your presentation talking about uh, English as an e English professor. Mm -hmm. And our story is not real. Most of the stuff that I know have been, when I was a child, I knew I couldn't have been that far from slavery, even though I had no understanding as a child. Mm -hmm. But I listened to those stories. I knew I wasn't that far from slavery, even though I had no concept of time. Mm -hmm. When I heard my grandfather tell stories of things that happened to him. Mm -hmm. But as time went on, get an understanding. Mm -hmm. To go back and believe in or trust in what the story that he tells me to be true, you find that doc you find documentation to support that particular story that he told. So I'm saying, like you said, with the English point of view, is your story orally is just as important as those stories that are told in a narrative form. Absolutely. And even though you might so you can articulate it well because you're an English professor. But to me, more, <laughs> right, 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 but your common person don't have the vernacular that you have a vocabulary or this or that. But so, oral history is not about that. Oral history is about right, the vernacular. I know, I know, it's even with the text, and that's why I say language itself. If you can understand what's being said, mm -hmm. 
language of service first. You have to have it in the King James language. And so I look at things like that to tell the story is just as important and to go back and research. Because now we have access to information even here, like you said, Jackson State has to report to IHA. Mm -hmm. You know. And so there's only so much that's going to be told by having access to that knowledge. That knowledge basically gives you a chance to tell your story. If you put it in a particular form, you still tell the story, but it, it won't reach as many people, but your story still gets told. Right. And so I was looking, I wasn't looking at so much as from a historical sociological point of view, like you talked about the restructuring of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't teach our history, just like you were saying, the way I look at the history being taught now, everything's about civil rights, right? Civil rights, right? But they don't show the side of those men that did have guns, those NAACP people that said, we tried the law. Mm -hmm. The law not working for us. Mm -hmm. So we going outside and we instruct our own law. Mm -hmm. Which we call uh, <coughs> wars or whatever, uh, or violence or whatever you want to say, but sometimes that's the price that must be paid. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you know, we can take that to nonviolent use. Because I tell people all the time, to give you my son, I'm going to say that. Martin Luther King believed in nonviolence. They killed him, right? Mm -hmm. My man believed in violence, and they killed him, so it don't make no difference. <laughs> what you do, that's what they do. You see the difference, the two different choices you have. And sometimes when you're going to be a person, not be so terrorized about what's put in your face too big right here, because you don't understand uh, how images and things are used. <coughs> to control you, social control, because all of them social control is pulling up control, and I still see those same tactics being used today. So as a living example, this is my story, because I'm at Jackson State, and I've been here, and I came to Jackson State like 20 and some years ago, and a lot of things that was here that was intact as far as history was here. This building's just opening, right? So when I came here, this was like an abandoned building. Right. But it was a lot of buildings on this street that were open. This is what I'm saying. So it's like things are being told backwards or whatever. It's an outside story. And they are saying that we are allowed to you put in the effort of the work and have you courageous enough to tell your own story with God and anybody believe you. That's, that's what we got to do. We use that thing about we have become individualized or competitive. Mm -hmm. That's their way where we said we're more communal. Mm -hmm. I was told that's our African tradition, all of our stuff in there. They said we don't have no ministry, right? Mm -hmm. But they find that we do have ministry. <laughs> because that's with the Temple of Two collection and things, with all those books that they won't let. You know, from my head, let people research the other than just not having access to it. You know, you say it here. But they want to, they will give you the idea that we were illiterate people, but we were not. That's exactly right. Sir? Okay, uh, you had mentioned earlier about the uh, psychological problem. Uh, to me, uh, it's almost like if you, okay, I don't want to offend anybody, but if you, if you have a weight, pro a weight problem, you have a food problem. So if you have a psychological problem, then what do you put in your mind? Mm -hmm. So how far are you going back? And I tell people all the time, uh, in, in, the, in the piggyback off of him, you know, a lot of times we stop at civil rights, but you felt you felt different once you found out that you know you felt the different. You didn't feel fear anymore once you found out that there were lynch mobs, there were people who res who respected and respected women, and, and that would die for their communities and stuff like that. So, to like I said, I go back, and if you don't define yourself, then somebody else will define you, that define you for them, for yourself. So, for and what I would like to say about that is, it's, it's simple. If you don't go back far enough, or if you don't, if you don't go look it up yourself, or if you don't go research the history yourself, you're gonna always think that you were a slave and that you just came into. So you have to go back farther. So you, it's almost like as, as African Americans, you have to you have to study yourself. You can't st when I say study yourself, I'm not talking about as far as history, but you have to go outside the edu educational realm and get into. Some you can go, you have to go back to African history. You go back to African history, then you go into oral history. Like some my grandfather can tell me about, you know, the things that happened when he was going through the civil rights and how people didn't just lay down and people didn't just take this. And after you do that, you start to transform your mind. I agree. No question, we have a club. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Ma'am. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to personal history, like what you went through. Uh, well, I'm from Oklahoma, and 
one of the things that I've seen is one, black history or African American history isn't really seen. Um, I actually in Oklahoma? In Oklahoma. Huh? Um, wow. Yeah, that being the whole black Wall Street and everything, it's, it's not. Um, I actually graduated from Booker T. Washington High School, which is an Ivy League high school, the only historically black high school still standing in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And yet, we only have the one course. Are you that from Tulsa? I am from Tulsa. Okay. Um, but we only have one course that even teaches our kids on African American history, only gets on slavery. I really didn't hear a lot about it until I came here for school. I didn't see a lot about it. I didn't see a lot of um, the activists or a lot of strong black people outside of family, of course, until I got here. And now, um, just recently this year alone, uh, in one of our districts in Jinx, I believe, they want to take out uh, the history of slavery. They don't want to teach it. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, in schools, in some of our schools now, they don't want to teach just that history. Um, they said it makes America look bad, they shouldn't teach it. Huh. They should be <laughs> okay. It does so, make America look bad. Go <laughs> But that doesn't mean we should teach it. Right. And um, that's the thing. And I feel like a lot of people say that, uh, and just like as both of these men hit on, um, obviously the history goes outside of school, but it's, it's, it's actually big. When you, when you teach history in school, that should be a big part of it. So again, um, I think it, it's very important for it to be taught in school. And as I say, the only reason why I would even, you know, fortunate enough to learn most about it that I know is because I came from historically black high school and came here. <laughs> so, uh, like, I just think it's very important. And even a lot of the places here, you know, for me to hear how, you know, just the historical aspect of Jackson, Mississippi, of Mississippi by itself, um, it's actually sad to see now there's still a lot of African American and black people who don't care. So that was just a big change um, for me, coming from Oklahoma, which is a predominantly white state, to come here and then just like, oh my God, some of the black people. So. Oklahoma is, is a predominantly white state, but Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska were home to the 26 all black town. Mm -hmm. I mean, black history, I would argue, post-slavery starts there. I mean, in the sense that in those places, people started over. Here, we were building on and resisting against racism. Well, they were there, too. But um, I'm just saying, they were able to go and say, OK, it's a do-over. Let's see what happens. I want to say this, and, and you don't have to agree with this. Let me walk back here, because I know we're going to talk here when I say this. Before I say what I'm going to say, let me offer this preamble. Before I went to graduate school, the thing that made me go back to graduate school for the master's, I don't even remember now how I got interested in slavery, but I got interested in slavery, and I started reading about slavery, and I read voraciously anything, uncritically, that said slavery I read. And I got so interested in it, and I said, I gotta go back to school and learn how to think about what I'm, what I'm reading. Right? And, I, and that's how I became an African Americanist. And from there, I started to learn more and more about, I, I went into literature because that's where money was, because that was the graduate assistantship, and, you know, I, I probably would have been a historian if they had given me some money. But um, I started reading broadly everything because, and, and even today, I read broadly. I can tell you all kinds of things you're not interested in <laughs> about the gold rush and the West and prostitutes in the West and Chinese people in the West because I get a little bit of something and I'm like, I gotta know all about that. And the one thing that I want to say to you is we always tend to say you've got to go back to slavery and start there and come this way. I want to offer a different model just for fun. You don't have to follow it, but just consider this. Instead of going all the way back and coming this way, why don't start here and work that way? Why not work out? Find out, I, I'd be willing to bet that many of you don't even know the real funky stories from your folks. You want to go back 250 years, you need to find out about the 60s. You need to find out about the 1930s. You need to find out about segregation. You can go that way. And it doesn't all have to be historical. This is the beauty of literature. Just because it's a fiction doesn't mean it's not true. Okay, it just means that the names were changed to protect the innocent. I'm saying you can read lots of different 
different things, but if you tell yourself you have to go all the way back to some distant point, you go back, you get one book, you're like, I don't know about this, I'm bored. And you stop, and now you still don't know anything. If you start from the part where you are work back, keeping whatever interests you about things, and keep working back that way, you know, I'm interested in cultural construction. I'm interested in how people rebuke isms of every kind. You, you only have to, there he is. <laughs> you only have to submit to these isms, sexism, racism, classism, whatever it is, if you choose to. There's a price to pay for freedom, right? You lose some stuff when you resist it, but you can resist it, but you have to understand where it is to resist it. Like you have to understand that lynch mobs that were protecting white women were circumscribing white women and deciding who white women could be and who they couldn't be. And it seems like a privilege, but it wasn't. And it took them until the, the revolution, the, the women's revolution in the 60s and 70s to begin to loosen some of that up. So I'm just saying, consider whatever you think might be interesting, start there and work back a little bit instead of going all the way back to the beginning, because where is that? I mean, you literally got to go back to Timbuktu. And it's a long way back to Timbuktu. It's important, but it's a long way back. You won't be back to here for a long time.
is set in the future about 97, 98 years, and the planet, the planet itself became uninhabitable. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so they send, they send 100 teenagers to the Earth as a form of like population control, but they don't tell them that to see if the Earth is inhabitable again. And with each person, they have a wristband, you know, so they can monitor their the life or whatever to make sure, you know, okay, they got there, they did die, maybe we can go back. Mm. And uh, one of the scenes, uh, the, the president of this new world that's in space uh, is a black man. Mm -hmm. And his son is one of the people that gets sent uh, to the Earth. Mm -hmm. And while they were there, they had like, a little revolution where they were like, OK, well, we can't, we can't be under their tier anymore. Everybody take your wristbands off. They'll think we're dead, and then you know, we'll move on. So he was one of the people that said, no, well, we can't do that because they'll think we're going high here, and the Earth is actually inhabitable. And that could be, that's our future, right? Basically, we're being very logical. Okay. And in the scene, <laughs> in the scene um, three of the guys that were one of the, well, part of the revolution, they took him out forcefully into the woods, you know, by gunpoint, and removed his wristband. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, um, have you, is, would you consider that a legend? And if you do, uh, are there other examples of that in the media that you can know? And as much as I've not seen the 100 and I'm not sure I got all of it from your summary, I would go with no, because lynching is the murder, the public murder of a person by three or more people in place of a justice system. Okay, well, they didn't, they didn't have a justice system. It was but I'm saying in, in the name of justice. Okay, so yeah. So, there needs to be like a criminal accusation. You, you, whatever the criminal liability is, yeah. and you say, I'm going to punish right. the three of them, more of us are going to punish you for that crime <laughs> in place of a standard criminal justice system. That's what a lynching is. Which is basically what they did. But psychologically, psychologically, there's no question about that. That is, which is why I don't have a team. Well, that's that's exactly why. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know they control it. You don't even know they're all down in here doing stuff and you making you watch it hour after hour and eat some more stuff. But so I you have food problems. <laughs> Some people say you get your gun out and you go away, and that's, that's how you resist. 
But I always thought it was very curious, but I think it's that narrative has even seeped into the civil rights movement and what it is teach that because people were likely to take up their guns. Mm -hmm. And that's not the perception that we get. So they had to teach them, leave your gun at home, show up at the church, we're going to teach you how to resist nonviolently. And I, I've seen some people say, no, I need my gun, and they left and they went away. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very interesting and connected that, that dialogue, why they had to focus on nonviolently. This is because people were likely to take up their guns and fight like that. The, I, I the other you. thing, apart from that, and somebody over here said I lost it now, is, is we, tend, we tend to think of things in terms of dichotomies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's peace and then there's violence. And, and if you're not, I don't think that kind of thing, because that's what's wrong with me. I, <laughs> I think that unitally, all, it's all these things are together, right? And so if you're a person who is dealing with violence, your response is, they come get me, I'm going to come get them too. Slap you, I'm going to slap you back, right? So you, the, you go to that polar response of either peace or violence. There's got to be some other ways to respond, even from there. But because everybody was armed, Right? I got to teach you, and he don't get your gun. You're right. And it was a great big lesson, particularly when people are punching you in your face and dumping tea on top of your head. And, but this is also how black people came to consider themselves morally superior. And the problem with that is that you can get so morally superior, you can't check your own self. OK, because there's some other stuff we need to check while we're not responding with violence. And this is part of the part, one of the points I'm trying to make is that we get stuck on, a, on our own pedestals yes. of feeling real good about the one thing we did right, and we don't want to interrogate the 360. Okay, so if you fix this one thing, you know, you're going to miss these other things. Do you see? And so this is why I started with epistemology. You've got to really think about how you're thinking about things. And we tend to think about things in terms of these opposites. This or that, I promise to let you go. Well, I'm gonna try to be a little quicker. Um, I grew up in a little small town in Louisiana named Gina. And the, it, it really shaped how I saw a lot of things. Um, I didn't really come full circle until a few years ago when my little town popped in the in the news, and of course I was an adult by then. Mm -hmm. But having grown up in that little town, <clears throat> having been usually one of two maybe black kids in a class full of whites because I was academically excelling and some people saw that and so they pushed me towards college courses rather than um, the vocational type things. I, I got the, the best of it. But I also got a little bit of the worst of it. I got, um, can you get out from in front of the class? Your hair is too big. I wore the afro. I'm dating myself, by the way. I'm probably twice as old as most of these people in this room. Um, and you know, there was <laughs> there was this 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 tree on the campus of the school where I went to, and and myself and my sisters and um, a couple of my friends would. Uh, ceremonialously go down there on certain lunch hours and sit on the bench where we were forbidden. And it was kind of our state. We're not going to go home or we're not going to not come here because you say we can't be here. Mm -hmm. But where I got that from was I had a mom at home who was very, this 11th grade uh, high school dropout with all these kids who had become just very politically involved in her community. She pushed us towards education. Um, and I took a lot of heat uh, from her kind of being out in visual. She didn't have a real good reputation apparently growing up, but all of a sudden she's this very political person, president of the PTA, and that sort of thing. But really to top it off, I had this six foot three dad who could pass for any white man in town and who had a really bad reputation of shooting people if they bothered his folks. Uh, and it wasn't just him, it was his brothers mm -hmm. and, and, you know, my uncles. And so I had to grow up under that reputation mm -hmm. of them being bad actors. And, um, and they could get away with it because, strangely enough, their grandfather was their, their father's white slave owner. But he was very 
present in their life. That was strange. That was very different for that town. And so he provided them with some protection when they would do things. They gambled with white men. You didn't gamble with white men, but they could because they could pass if they could not really recognize who they were. So a lot of that shape, my, my dad was very self-hating. He hated his skin color. He hated his hair. He hated everything about himself. I was probably 12 before I realized that he wasn't a white man, that he was a black man. And it didn't really matter to me, that was my dad. But that shaped me, and then that town, it was very, very, um, I, I didn't have to go back to slavery, I didn't have to talk about slavery, it was constant, you know, name calling, it was just constant bombarding of black names and negative you know, and so we fought against that all the time. And so what had to happen was after I left that environment going to college, I went to Grammar State University, by the way, but <laughs> <laughs> I am here to get my master's. Might be the wrong yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jackson. Oh, you don't get a <laughs> I'm in the master's program here, so I'm gonna be a Jackson State person now. So I love Jackson State too. Um, so I had to really reshape because my father kind of put that, we, we, all, we were always talking about race in our house, and he was always talking about the white men and how they bet that coming, and, and if they came to his house, they were not allowed in the house. My brothers would come home from college, they had a car, they would be followed, you know, by the sheriff, you know, all of that stuff. I don't have to go back, I live that. And so I had to reshape how I saw other people because I was kind of bombarded with prejudice. Mm -hmm. You know, don't like them because, and he was like, well, why? And so after it got to be a conflict, I had to figure it out. Mm -hmm. That, you know, for myself, I had to come into my own about who I, who I was, what I would accept, that's just part of who I am. You know, and it's okay that white people are white people, black people are black people, we're not all bad, we're not all horrible, you know. So it took a lot of undoing when you were conditioned every day mm -hmm. to kind of hate not only whites, but almost kind of hating yourself. I never understood why my dad, I understand now what his struggles were. And I, I wish I had been older enough before he passed away to have that conversation with him. You know, because at least my dad was there, you know, yeah. you know so, yeah. So that's my story. Well, thank you for sharing. Yes. I'll go to Ms. I wanted to go back to Kim's point about, she asked about whether or not blacks learn violence from white folks. And I just wanted to point out as a follower of West Africa, uh, violence is not the East Europeans. No. <laughs> and I read accounts in, in, for example, in the economy, it seems to be empires. They have the most, we do get to be more with this one, which forms a body. So, uh, a, lower, a lower chief who somehow insulted the king, one form of body would be that you cut that chief's body into four parts and you divide the four parts to each corner of his town as a way of showing any other people who want to insult the king. Mm -hmm. This might happen to you. Mm -hmm. So, I, I guess I would say that maybe, the, so the types of Bias is not unique to white folks. Maybe what's unique to Europeans is that the, the sort of consistent scale of violence. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was something new. Because it went around the world mm -hmm. exporting violence. But, but I read many accounts, vicious accounts of violence in, in just the name archives. Now, what I want to ask you though, is I want to share a thought about what you get to I'm going to respond to that before you go on. Again, I don't want to presume to have an authoritative close on this, but of the things that I've read, certainly, but I've read a lot about violence, mm -hmm. um, is that one of the sort of cultural differences is that Anglo-American violence can, can, can be more or less arbitrary and not tied to sort of first thing. For, for African-centered African people, violence tends to be more personal. In other words, somebody has to offend you no, or your town or your kingdom or whatever. It has to be connected to something about you. You wouldn't be a mercenary. Yeah, or just because. What about, for example, if a king, if a king dies, 
And as a king, you have to have people in the other world, because there's no sense of the heaven, which goes to the ancestors around. Mm -hmm. You have to have helpers. Right. And so you kill maybe 40 people to go with you. It's the other, it's the other realm. Right. Yeah. Would you say that's a, is that something that would not follow up? I would probably try to take the safety of the high ground and say that each cultural situation is dictated by its own paradigm. Okay, so if you are the king and you need helpers in the next realm, and everybody knows that, that's what it is to be king in that realm. They gotta go with you, that's what they gotta go do. So that's not violent so much. But the individual about the violence. Maybe. The individual, well, I, I read the council, the individual is trying to get away. Okay. They know when the king died, he got town. It does exist, 
and they have pushed away, like the young lady said in Oklahoma, how to try to um, take away um, slavery out of the system because it makes America look bad. But they ain't trying to close these prisons down if they're building. You know, um, so I feel, and, and it's because it's a book called, uh, I guess, Cotton to Mississippi. I had read and a guy came last year that spoke uh, through the criminal justice, and from here in George Brown, even to now, it's, it's been replaced with the justice system. Yes, the justice system somewhat was a safety for black people back in those days, but look at it now because it's gotten out of control. because. In, in each field, there's always going to be somebody that's not going to follow direction. But within the prison system, because I work in it, is I feel like it exists. And we, when I say we, I'm speaking of African American because that's mostly, or mostly everybody that's there in the prison system are black. Our supervisors are white, and if you make it up there, it's because you scheming and you trying to trying to along with them. In other words, they act like house niggas. Excuse me, and I don't mean no harm the way I'm talking. I'm just want to get it over because I know y'all ready to go, but I'm just trying to express this to tell my, you know, to express my point of view. Go ahead. Um, and I feel like um, in, in a prison, and it's worth the same way down a prison system because, like, the zero tolerance now is. 10 years old and you the prison system. You know if, if you're 10 and you go to jail, you'll never be nothing. You know what I'm saying? I don't say you'll never be nothing, but it's gonna be on your record depending on what it is. So you are already from the door uh, blocked and you're limited. Same as it was in slavery. You're limited. You know, at the hand of, so to speak, the white man, but now we're not limited just by the white man. We're just like we're depressing ourselves or we're all because we are educated. The system has changed. We do have a voice, but we're not using our voice. Some things I ask my son about because he goes to a private school. And I'm the reason why he goes to a private school because they didn't have no full-time people, nobody but subs. Mm -hmm. And that's not right for him to have a sub and somebody ain't gonna be there, but that's another story. But anyway, <laughs> in his school, they don't they didn't teach him from black history came. I was a little bit more ethnic because my grandmother was also first skin, so I can also relate with you. Uh, when about how they treat you. And um, we had a better upbringing than the rest because my grandma was fair skinned. And I think some of the people might have been by the house, man, you know, whatever. But I grew up being prejudiced against white people. And I was back here sharing with my, my, my colleague and my classmate that what stopped me from being so ignorant. And I, and I went to uh, my, my family, made sure I was educated around a lot of white people of culture. You know, they don't always want the best for me. But, um, it took me to be on Rainbow Road, and I had plenty. Three black men passed me by, and I don't mean no harm. If I wasn't trying to screw, get my phone number out, neither one of them changed my flat tire. Mm -hmm. I called my dad, a white At the time, I thought I was going to be a nurse some years ago. So I got on a white uniform with a nurse's thing. Anybody know you in all white, you on the side of the road, stop. But none of the black people that rolling one down, they was trying to holler at me. But because I wasn't trying to screw, give no money, on my phone number, they wouldn't help me. It took a white man to come down the street. He was on his way home. He changed my tie. By that time, my dad came. And he he came, like, want to know because he thought the man was doing something to me. <coughs> and I was like, no, nah, dad. And I offered to give him $20. And you know what he said? He said, um, I'm doing for your daughter because I have a daughter and a wife. And I would hope somebody would do the same for me. So that's what took my ignorance away. But I lived through them burning down our house, burning down a bridge. And we stuck in a, another part of the city for months until they redid the bridge because it's, it ain't nothing but a hole under there. You know, so I come from it too. But as I've gotten older, educating myself, and I'm trying to raise my son, he won't get shot down or he won't be misguided because he's exceptionally smart. So I have to gain all this knowledge feeding him. But and in in, I came out of the criminal justice system because it reminded me of slavery. They don't want no change. They're not preparing them with things. They're not giving them the resources but the government. Our taxpayer money will fund the system, the criminal justice system. So it's like they want us to be suppressed. Not, when I say us, not all of us. Some of us are going to get out. You know what I'm saying? But it's a problem when majority is when we start at 10. But we're educated now. We're supposed to be a voice, but it's not a change. It's like we're going back down into slavery. We ain't picking no cotton, but we all get our kids get locked up. You know what I'm saying? So that's my form is they went from picking cotton to not even jail cells. And they make, they make a thing, they sell them work for cheap, working like dogs, 
white man black, but majority is Hispanics and it's blacks that hold in the Texas system. Now I'm through. <laughs> I mean, so that's why I say it all exists. It's just been sweeped up on the road. Well, thank you for that. Let, let me um, say something about what you said uh, in, in, in response to, again, interdisciplinary. That, um, you know, one of the reasons there's so many different majors you can choose in, um, if you were a sociologist, you'd be interested in systems. Okay, so one of the things that your epiphany should show you by your tire, flat tire epiphany, is that most things don't, it's not about individual people, that's not where the insult comes, it comes through the combination of these systems and these master narratives that we internalize about who people are and what that means, right? Okay, so there are black people who think all white people are bad, and white people think all black people are bad, but everybody has their one white friend at work. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And you like that person, and you know you give her money and stuff. But, <laughs> because, because that doesn't have anything to do with the overarching issue of racism. The isms are about systems of power. And so you have to unpack the system to understand, one, who is operating that system. And the same person is operating the, the prison system is the person, or, or, or the, I don't know, it's not a person, it's the entities that also operated slavery, who operated, you name it. Okay, so, so it's really important, and to me, this is how education sets you free. Instead of being mad about stuff, Try to unpack it. Try to understand how does it operate? And because it's it's rarely that there's somebody behind it. I mean, that's the whole meaning of the Wizard of Oz, right? There is no great and powerful Oz. It was just a bald-headed man behind a curtain working some dials. Okay, so you've got to figure out who, you know, who's working the dials. How do we stop that? And and also, once you understand, once you can unpack that. And if you can be dispassionate about it for a minute, because it, it makes people angry. If I'm not angry every second of the day about lynching, I have been angry, but you can't stay angry if you're trying to understand something. That you, you've got to let go of that to try to understand how do I uncouple myself and my systems and my people from whatever these, these negative cycles are. Okay, if we don't like the prison industrial complex, we could stop that, but you can't stop that. Yeah. Well, you sure can't stop it being upset. And you can't do anything being upset. But you can't stop it for all people who need jobs. Some people need to be in prison. <laughs> we don't ever want to own that. Some people need lynching. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. 
I'm saying I want you to begin to think of things in a much more complex, sophisticated manner that you depersonalize so you can understand why people do what they do. So that you'll recognize it again when you see it. Because what's going to happen is you won't recognize it when you do it. That's right. That's right. Amen. God's <laughs>